Sunrise near Delft in Holland, homeland of Johannes Vermeer. He's one of the great painters of light, but until recently, he himself has been obscured, lost in the darkness of the past. I've come here to try to tell his story, to shed light on a life that's remained secret for more than 300 years. It's a tale of love and death, about a man who dreamed of a perfect world, but who ended up drowning. It's a story about a real flood, the flood of 1672, the year of disaster, the Dutch called it, when the dikes were broken and the country was inundated. But it's also a story about rising tides of debt, about the market forces that can swamp and destroy a life. 17th century Holland was a balancing act. It was a nation poised between land and sea, between debit and credit. And at the centre of it all, there was the windmill. There were thousands of these machines all over the landscape, busily pumping water from one level to another, making Dutch life and Dutch prosperity possible. But what's all this got to do with the secret life of one of Holland's greatest painters? Well, I think Vermeer's life was a balancing act too, a constant struggle to keep flood water at bay, which, in the end, seems to have gone horribly wrong. Vermeer painted stillness, but he died, they say, in a frenzy, a fit of madness at the age of just 43. I wanted to find out why. Madness is the last thing associated with Vermeer's work, but I was interested in the passions that ran beneath the calm waters of his art. So I went to Delft, the city he lived and worked in all his life, in the hope of building a psychological profile of the artist. In recent years, a mass of new evidence has been unearthed about his family. Stories of manslaughter, counterfeiting, lottery fraud and domestic violence. These discoveries haven't made the headlines, but I think they hold the key to a completely new way of looking at Vermeer and making sense of some of the greatest paintings ever created. To begin to understand him, we need to understand his city. Vermeer's Delft was a sink or swim world, a merchant town where fortunes could be made and lost. Its canals were its arteries, water was power, hence the in-your-face splendor of the waterboard. Vermeer lived in the so-called Golden Age. Trade in the East Indies brought vast wealth and with it an expanding market for art. But Delft was also scarred by conflict. It had been at the center of the Dutch war with Catholic Spain and after bitter religious strife, the Protestants were in the ascendant. Then, in 1652, when Vermeer turned 20, it was a city in trauma. A freak explosion in the gunpowder stores destroyed the town center and killed hundreds of its citizens. Yet there's not a hint of disturbance in Vermeer's Delft interiors. Scenes of women playing music, thinking, dreaming, and what could be more peaceful than his panorama of the city? The novelist Proust thought Vermeer's view of Delft the greatest painting there is, and one of his characters breathes his last thinking of a patch of yellow paint glowing in the sun. It's so becalmed, and for me that's its mystery, the mystery of Vermeer himself. He took a turbulent reality and made it look like heaven on earth.
Was there a pattern to his perfectionism, one which could also explain his eventual breakdown and madness? I was hoping to find some answers inside the city walls, and in a cunning attempt to blend in with the locals, I'd rented an exceptionally orange bicycle. Vermeer grew up in the centre of town, on the Great Market Square, where the rich lived, although he and his family were not particularly well off. His father, Rainier, who in his youth had committed manslaughter in a canal-side brawl, owned an inn on the square and ran an art-dealing business on the side. The young Vermeer grew up among paintings and pints of beer. None of the buildings where he actually lived survives, and it's not always easy to follow in his footsteps. The plaque says that Vermeer was born in this house in October 1632, but it's wrong, he wasn't. X does not mark the spot. In fact, the house where he was born used to be just around the corner, where today we have the Jan Vermeer Nursery School. He's elusive too, we don't really know what he looked like. It's thought that he included a self-portrait as the figure on the left in this painting, the first he ever dated, from 1656. It's called the Procurus, and it seems to be an attempt to depict the rambunctious world of tavern and brothel, the world he'd grown up in. But it's a subject which he never returns to. And on the character on the left, itself a quotation from another painting, may be Vermeer's own face in the shadows. He looks out at us and leers. For hard evidence, I went to the Delft archives, where many of the pieces of the Vermeer puzzle are to be found. And although they're only isolated forensic traces, from them, I think we can start to build a mental picture, both of the artist and of the nature of his tragedy. <laughs> right, Vermeer's life. But when we talk about the documents that make up a 17th century life, what kind of documents are we actually looking at? We are looking at registers of baptism, of matrimony, of uh, burial. We're looking at uh, testaments, uh, business documents, transactions. That sort of things. But quite impersonal. We're not quite talking impersonal. about personal letters, personal accounts. We're really... None whatsoever. Right. So we need to do a bit of reading in between the lines. Yes, you do. Yeah. So just show me some of the things that you have here. Uh, All right. To start with, here is the register of baptism in a new church. It's interesting that Vermeer was christened Johannes rather than plain old Jan, a posh Latinate name with social aspiration written all over it. His parents clearly had plans for him, ambitions he'd live up to, until his sudden descent into poverty and madness. And there's evidence for that in the register of Vermeer's death from the Delft Charity Chamber, the local social services. When anyone died, they'd send for his finest piece of clothing, which would be sold to raise money for the poor, the best outer garment tax, it was called. But when Vermeer died... Oh, so this means nothing to get. Yeah. Here, and then he writes nothing again. Here, nothing to get, nothing. Du double yes. nothing. Yeah. Big fat zero. Poor Vermeer. But he wasn't the first poor Vermeer. And the latest revelation of the archives is that the fear of financial ruin had haunted the previous generation of his family. Meet the ancestors. His paternal grandmother, Nieltke Goris, or Little Nell, had a job clearing people's houses of jumble and bric-a-brac and selling it off for a song. She was an utdragster, someone who drags things out. Unofficially, she was a crook and small-time con artist who ran semi-legal lotteries and raffles and was often in trouble with the law. And as for Vermeer's maternal grandfather, Balthazar, he claimed to be an engineer and clockmaker, 
But when the police arrested him in April 1619, he was running a counterfeit coin operation with his son, Vermeer's uncle. Counterfeiting was serious stuff, a crime against the state. Was there no end, I wondered, to the lengths Vermeer's family would go to to keep their heads above water? I went to see an expert on coin forgery, called a graph, who said he had something to show me that would prove that not everything was as it seemed. What do you know about Vermeer's slightly dodgy grandfather, Balthazar Gerritz? Gerritz, yes. Gerritz. Well, Balthazar Gerritz was a kind of strange, well, strange person. He tried to make a lot of money by all kinds of means. Um, he was a broker for a while. He tried to, uh, to sell um, shares of the uh, East Indian Comp Company. Um, he tried to buy and sell uh, houses. Um, and he also made false coins, so coin forgery. That so was, he literally made some money? He really made some money, literally, yes. And I assume that we know about it because he got caught. Yes, indeed he was caught, but yeah, that's also the strange thing. Um, he managed to survive, which is very unusual for uh, coin forgers. Apparently, like most counterfeiters, two of his co-conspirators were tortured and then beheaded, but not Balthazar. Corps had records of meetings which showed that in his case, the whole affair was hushed up at the highest level of government. Balthazar was allowed to go free. And in silence. When Balthazar came back to Delft, yeah. when the whole matter is sort of swept under the carpet, yeah. do you think people here would have known? Oh, oh yeah, D definitely. Especially people in, in, the, in the city like this, yeah, they would have known it. Whatever the word on the street was, the whole family was involved. Vermeer's uncle was imprisoned as a co-conspirator, and both sides of the family, including Niltke the Utdragster, rallied round to have him bailed. Whether we should think of Balthazar as an informer, a common criminal, or even a secret agent, this would have been a grim moment in the family history. Prison and torture, it's the dark side of the 17th century Dutch free market, the other side of the coin, and it's sure as hell a far cry from Vermeer's serene interiors. I wondered if I could make sense of Vermeer as a man desperate to escape from the prison of his own dubious past. Art was to be his way out and up. He became a respectable counterfeiter, a forger not of false coins, but of reality. There may have been darkness in his family background, but he painted light. More often than not, the light is falling upon a young woman. In 1653, at the age of 21, he proposed to Katerina Bolnes, a Catholic girl from a wealthy family several rungs higher up the social ladder. It was the most important decision of his life. We know that Vermeer was baptised in the new church on October the 31st, 1632. And we know that in the town hall, he declared his intention to marry Katerina Bolnes on April the 5th, 1653. But for those intervening 21 years, more or less everything about his life is a mystery. Archivally speaking, it's a void, not a single document. We don't know where Vermeer went to school. We don't know who taught him to paint. But the biggest mystery of all is how come this Protestant man, this son of a publican, with a grandfather with a criminal past, managed to seduce and even to marry a woman from a high-born Catholic family. To be a Catholic was to live part of your life in secret. It meant worship in hidden churches, townhouses which were not allowed to advertise their purpose to the outside world. 